Hey everybody, welcome. The director of Welcome to Raccoon City made a lot of comments about his movie recently. And I thought it would be kind of fun to just go through them and react to them and just kind of talk about some of the positives and some of the negatives of what he had to say. Now before we get started, if you may be so kind, please like and subscribe. I'm just starting out and every little bit helps. But if you don't want to, that's fine too. I appreciate your view all the same. So, let's go. Claire arrives in, in Raccoon City looking uh, looking for her brother, Chris. She grew up in Raccoon City uh, in the orphanage with her brother and ran away when she was just a child. And she's now back. Claire Redfield is a very... Okay, that's very interesting right there. The fact that Claire ran away from Raccoon City when she was a child. Makes me wonder what age exactly he means by child. Because that, of course, makes you wonder, because he specifically said that Claire ran away, not that Claire and Chris ran away. So, how close are Claire and Chris, really, in this movie? You know, what is their relationship like? Did they stay in touch when Claire ran away if Chris wasn't with her? It's very interesting, because even though we don't see a lot of interaction between them in the games, because for whatever reason Capcom always keeps them separate, they still seem to have a decent relationship and seem to be kind of close. Not as close as Alfred and Alexia, of course, but close in a normal way. Haunted soul um, who ran away from uh, Raccoon City when she was very young um, because she felt she saw some things and she feels it's an evil place where there's some nefarious things going on. And she has spent her, you know, the last few years reinforcing uh, her knowledge on Umbrella. And that is also very interesting in itself. This is something Emma Evans mentioned on another video. The fact that Claire and presumably Chris were in the Raccoon City Orphanage, and we know from the games that children were experimented on in that orphanage, specifically by Umbrella. Claire very easily could have seen something there. And I believe Chris even mentions that she had a lot of conspiracy theories when she was a child as well, and he doesn't seem to believe her. Which is probably what also drove a huge wedge between them, if they indeed don't have a good relationship in this movie. It's a very unexpected angle to take with Claire, and I didn't like it initially. It seems like that would be a good storyline for another character, and yet, it does add extra dimension to Claire, not that she necessarily needed it, the, the fact that she was an average college student who kind of had to rise to the occasion was compelling enough on its own in the games. But, uh, I mean, we'll see how it goes. In this scene, Claire is, is um, playing a videotape um, of a character that we'll see more of in the, in the movie called Ben Bertolucci, um, who is a conspiracy theorist on Umbrella and who's been feeding Claire with... Um, information of what he believes are Umbrella's evil doings. That's a pretty wild change on its own as well. And now for this, he's all of a sudden Claire's source, and Ada doesn't seem to be in the picture. And hell, actually in this still shot here, we kind of see Birkin in the orphanage, so he might have directly been doing experiments on those kids himself, which may tie into Lisa Trevor. And I'm wondering more and more if the history of the Trevor family is going to be explored. Because it's not really important information to know who was the architect of the Spencer Mansion. It's just one of those cool background details that, you know, you read in the files in the games. You can kind of, like, get little nuggets of information here and there in other games about George Trevor and other umbrella facilities he built. But I do hope we'll find out a little bit about that. William Birkin is, is a major role in this uh, movie, which, which really does uh, draw a lot of its influence from the second Resident Evil game. And we will see a lot of Birkin throughout the movie. And uh, he's a really interesting and quite a complex character in this film. You see, Umbrella, they have an incident. I'm talking to Chernobyl, if you know what I mean. Lisa. I'm going to pause there real quick just to talk about Birkin, because it is great to hear that we're going to see a lot of him. Whether that's in human form or monster form remains to be seen. Either is okay with me, honestly. I would love to see a lot of Birkin monster action, however, and, you know, various forms. Although I don't know if this movie has the budget to do, like, four transformations of him, but at the very least I hope to see his first stage where he's still got some human features. 
Because that, to me, is the iconic form of, you know, G. Birkin from the games, with the swinging pipe and all of that. And I know people say Neil McDonough, Mc, McDonough, whatever the hell his name is, is too old to play Birkin because Birkin and Wesker basically attended the Umbrella Academy together and all that. It doesn't bother me just for the sheer fact that Neil What's-His-Face is a tremendous actor. He elevates everything that he's in, in one way or another. He either chews the scenery in very cartoony ways, if it's something relatively goofy, or he can just be dead serious. Like, he's really famous for Band of Brothers and, you know, projects like that where a lot of emotional weight is put on him, and he always delivers. I've never been disappointed by any of his performances, and I can't say that about a lot of actors. Trevor was a, was a really great character for this movie because not been in any of the other movies before. And she, in the game, she's quite a haunted, tragic, but terrifying character. And I really wanted to take that and bring that into this movie. So she's pretty scary, but she's also really quite tragic. And that's really good to hear. It instills some confidence if he's not stretching the truth by any means. Because Lisa was by far the best addition to the Resident Evil remake. Obviously, she wasn't in the original Resident Evil PS1 game. She was added into the remake for for the sake of surprises and just a more kind of the phrasing he said, a more haunting, tragic sort of story added to the background of the game. And I hope she really is as fearsome as she is in the games. Because if I remember correctly, she basically has a nemesis parasite growing inside of her. But I hope Lisa is more than just a basic zombie. I, I hope she's got some of those little tendrils that she had in, in the gameplay. I really wanted this uh, movie to, to reflect the game uh, as closely as I could in, in many ways. So with the police station, for instance, and the mansion, we... we um, contacted Capcom or we were working hand in hand with Capcom to be honest uh, and uh, they gave us the actual blueprints for the police station and the mansion so we could build a, a life version of the game so it was it was super fun doing that kind of stuff the sets are one of the best parts of the trailers from what I'm seeing and I'm extremely excited to see the Spencer mansion the fact that it's in some ways a direct recreation of the mansion from the game. It's just nice to hear about a movie having that kind of attention to detail when it comes to the sets. Not that there's anything wrong with the mansion we briefly saw in the first Paul W.S. Anderson Resident Evil movie. It actually looked pretty neat and creepy and really appropriate for this for the setting, but it wasn't the Spencer Mansion. You know, there's something special about the layout of that mansion. At least to me. I mean, I grew up running around that place, so maybe I'm biased. The truck driver was actually my way into the script when I was writing it, I was so obsessed with the second game when I was writing this um, movie. And so it, it, we really do use the opening of the second game heavily. This It is kind of neat to see the truck driver make it in. It doesn't seem like the actual crash is going to serve the same purpose. I doubt we're going to see Claire and Leon get split up by the explosion of the truck and all that. But it's still neat to see an iconic moment like that make it in. And it's always reassuring to hear that the director of an adaptation was quote-unquote obsessed with any part of the source material. This movie is very heavily based around Leon Kennedy's first day uh, on his job as, as per the uh, games, uh, but particularly the first Resident Evil 2, not the um, remake. I really wanted to go back to nerdy, uh, nerdy, geeky, uh, Leon Kennedy. I'm even happy to hear that. I mean, casting aside, but yeah, I hope I end up liking Leon in the movie. Because I love Leon in the original RE2. I still like them a lot in the remake. I was a bit upset by the fact that they kind of put a little of his trash talky personality from RE4 into the RE2 remake. Like, when the bell falls, he makes some kind of remark, oh, that's, that's gonna be a lot of paperwork. And then when the gator, when the gator goes pop, he has some kind of like trash talk line there too. I didn't like that. I hate the fact that regular people are cracking jokes in the face of monsters and stuff like that. I hate that. I hate that aspect and that's why I don't like Leon that much because he's like the main perpetrator of that. I love him in RE2 but in other things going forward especially RE4 I don't really care for Leon as a character. Especially him just constantly being saddled with 
and I've said this before, but just constantly being saddled with the Batman Catwoman dynamic with Ada Wong and just this constant back and forth where there's no character progression whatsoever. To me, it's annoying. I know other people can't get enough of that. It's just a difference of opinions. Chief Irons uh, in this movie is is a is a very large role, and Donald Logue really, I just sort of let him go. You know, we wound him up and let him go, and he just went for it. So he's hilarious. It, 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 there's humor in it, but he's 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 a bad man. But he's not he's not evil. He's just he's in the script. He's described as someone who's counting down his days to till he can go on the golf course and collect his pension and and he's this uh, sort of slightly overweight amazing he's, he's all about that mustache but he's 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 a fantastic role in this movie everything he just said about irons kind of makes me shrug a little bit because while i don't like the version of chief irons in the remake because he was just too over the top evil from the get-go I kind of preferred the more calmer, subtle, Hannibal Lecter-esque version from the original RE2. But the fact that he says Irons in this movie isn't evil, that's a little concerning to me. Because even the version that I like from the original RE2, I would consider him evil. Now the upside is he describes letting Donald Logue just go nuts with the character. And that he goes absolutely wild. And that gives me hope that he is still extremely unhinged. Maybe they won't have time to explore the the whole he hunted down the mayor's daughter and stuffed her kind of thing. It would be a shame to lose that. It would be a really big shame to lose that because that is such a huge part of that character. But I would be okay with an even more subtle version as long as he's not a good guy. I don't want him to be a good guy. I don't want him to be any kind of a protagonist. I just... You know, he has to be crooked. And it also seems like in some ways he might be replacing Marvin. Because we don't see any glimpse of Marvin in the trailers. That's just something I'm assuming because I haven't heard anything about Marvin being cast in this movie. I freaking love Marvin, man. He's so... I hate to keep using the word iconic, but he is an iconic character from Resident Evil 2. And it was really heartbreaking seeing an expansion upon his story in the Resident Evil 3 remake. Actually seeing Brad biting him. It was heartbreaking. But uh, all I can really do is hope that Irons has done well. It was really important to me in this movie to to scare people and, and to create a kind of dark, creepy atmosphere that I felt that um, maybe had been missing from the, the previous movies, which were much more action. So it's super, obviously, visually dark movie, but my influences were really heavily, heavily 70s. Uh, so kind of on some of the movies that influenced the game, obviously all the Romero movies, um, but but also some slightly more classic kind of uh, like The Exorcist and uh, just 70 filmmakers, 70s filmmaking in general uh, was, was very heavily influencing this movie. And, and John Carpenter, I mean, as you'll see throughout the trailer, it has a Assault and Precinct 13 vibe, which was key to this movie. Yeah, there's been other times where he's referenced John Carpenter specifically as an influence. And that excites me to no end. I absolutely love Big Trouble in Little China, In the Mouth of Madness, Halloween. I'm even one of those people who likes Halloween too. The Thing is easily in my top five favorite movies of all time. So any kind of influence from John Carpenter on this movie has me really excited. Also, just real quick before I hit play, something I kind of like that I never noticed before is here we see Chris just kind of wearing a brown jacket. It reminds me of of the brown jacket we see hanging up in the star's office in the games. It would be kind of cool if Chris and Claire have their matching jackets in the movie. I doubt it. Without a doubt, the, the hardest thing about this movie was the zombies. Because there's so much history and uh, weight uh, when you do a zombie movie, weight of people's expectations. Are they slow zombies? Are they fast zombies? Are they Romero zombies? Are they Zack Snyder's zombies? It was so important to me to scare people whilst giving them, you know, I, I'm a very classic uh, person in my taste. And so so I wanted that kind of Romero feel to it, but I needed I needed these zombies to be scary and disturbing. But yeah, we, we do a mixture of fast and slow because there is different zombies in, in the game. The crimson head and people, you know, turning and 
getting sick and there's a lot of variety in this first of all the fact that he mentioned the crimson heads kind of you know just just the fact that he calls them the crimson heads is like okay he 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 knows his stuff at the very least he knows his references so he probably isn't lying when he says he's you know such a such a big fan of the games but i absolutely see his point about the zombies and it being difficult to get them just right because there's been so many different types of zombies even just within the games the zombies in the original resident evil 2 are completely different from the zombies in the resident evil 2 remake the ones in the resident evil 2 remake are absolutely relentless you can blow arms off legs off and they're still coming at you you can shoot them in the head they'll they'll fall down but they'll get back up a couple minutes later you can blow all their limbs off and they'll still be trying to wriggle towards you i would love to see that kind of zombie in the movie but then it kind of makes it less realistic that anybody survived this whole city being infected because good grief, those zombies are the most intimidating out of any of the games. But it's kind of cool to hear his thought process about going like, okay, we got these kind of zombies, this kind of zombies, this kind of zombies. What can we, what can we do? What should we implement? Uh, maybe we'll do a mixture. We'll do some slow ones. We'll do some fast ones. Because I mean, that would only make sense, honestly. You would have some zombies that are already really damaged. Maybe when they were still human, they got all kinds of messed up and then they ended up turning later. So they would be slower because they got less body parts to work with. Then you would have the freshly turned who would be able to be a bit faster. You know, that makes sense in my head, at least. I don't know if you guys agree. But when it comes to zombie movies, the actual zombies are kind of important. So you gotta put some thought behind them. One of the things I had to do in this movie was to somehow combine the two games, the, the mansion and the police station. And obviously they, in the in gaming world, they, they don't take place together, you know, um, in the same timeline. Um, but I really wanted that to happen within the same timeline here. So we had to, I had to condense that in, into the narrative. But I think it works really super well. So you have the whole, um, Alpha team going to find Bravo team whilst Claire comes in to find her brother and the two narratives work concurrently. That's one of the most controversial decisions because it really changes the dynamic of the franchise. Because in the game universe, the mansion incident takes place quite a bit before Raccoon City's downfall. And you have the surviving members of Stars from the mansion incident coming back to the city and just trying to spread awareness being like, hey, Umbrella Corporation is freaking evil. We, we gotta stop them. We need to do something. And you have Brian Irons, who is covering everything up for Umbrella, saying, you have no proof. You know, Jill, you're suspended. Blah, blah, blah. Chris, get the hell out of here. And in this movie, it's going to be happening on the same night. And so things, you know, you're not going to have that... That kind of in-between storyline of them trying to spread that awareness. It's going to be boom, boom. A happens, B happens, or A happens while B is happening. And you wouldn't necessarily think so, but that does change things a lot. And just the fact that we see Chris and Claire together in this movie, that's pretty big. That is pretty big. The eagle-eyed uh, amongst viewers might notice this video from Code Veronica, which is Ashford Twins. I, I always found it a, a really disturbing little video, so I really wanted to put it into this movie. We bring it in a little in, into in some of the experimentations that uh, Dr. Merkin is doing. But I've, I always really just wanted to recreate that video. I found it just kind of disturbing for some reason, ripping me. We actually use, Capcom gave us proper game footage and I use a little tiny shot in the movie of the real Ashford Twins footage in there. I snuck it in. For real though, I'm just gonna say it. That is what makes me the most excited about this movie and where this movie franchise can go. Because even amongst Resident Evil fans, Code Veronica does not get the credit that I feel like it's always deserved. And you know what? I do understand it. Because that game is absolutely infuriating to play. They blindside you with Chris coming in halfway through when you've already taken all the weapons, used all the ammo as Claire. <laughs> <laughs> and then they switch very randomly between the characters at that point and you just end up getting completely screwed over by okay this character has this weapon but this character has access to the ammo and you can't it's and then oh you gotta fight this boss as this character and i switched all the weapons over to the other character i gotta restart the game that kind of thing so i understand why it's not beloved but to me it has if not the best it has one of the best stories in the franchise and that's because of the Alfred and Alexia stuff, the backstory of the Ashford family, the T. Veronica virus and how screwed up that is. 
finding out more about the founding of Umbrella, the stuff with Nosferatu and what Alfred and Alexia did to him, Wesker's return, the whole, you know, the whole Rockfort Island deal, being a prison camp, all that kind of stuff. I love the story from that game. I'm, I'm so annoyed by the rumors that we're getting a Resident Evil 4 remake and that Code Veronica is just being completely skipped over. Because Resident Evil 4 is already great gameplay-wise. I hate the story. If they can fix that in a remake, then hey, by all means, go ahead. But I still think Resident Evil 4 is a great game to play. I still replay it fairly regularly, actually. Code Veronica could use way more of an update than Resident Evil 4. If, if they could redo it, iron out the character switching, make it more, more seamless, a bit less infuriating to navigate, it could be an absolute top-notch game. But I digress. I'm excited by the idea of a potential sequel being about Code Veronica's storyline, meeting live-action versions of Alfred and Alexia. I, it might happen with Jill and Leon also being present. Leon might, as, as we've kind of speculated in my uh, comment section here and there, I believe, and on Reddit, Leon might end up taking the place of Steve, not necessarily dying and transforming and all that. I doubt they would ever do that. But just in general, taking the place of the one who teams up with Claire for the first part of you know, the story. I could definitely see that happening. And then I could also see Chris and Jill showing up later on, getting to the island. There's a lot of potential for a really, really good Code Veronica movie. And if Raccoon City gets destroyed at the end of this one, we're definitely not getting Resident Evil 3 in live action. Which would be a shame, but I mean, me personally, I'm extremely excited about the potential of seeing Code Veronica done well. So, eh, it's, it's kind of a toss-up about whether that decision is good or bad. For me, I find it to be good, but let's continue. What we have when the film starts is Claire coming into town and she starts to see that it's, you know, Raccoon City in this movie is a ghost town and the people in the town are very sick. And we really tried to create a very Stephen King kind of vibe of, of this dying town and creepy people's staring behind windows and stuff like that. Split up. I really like the fact that Raccoon City seems to actually be a town again. I hated how in the games it kind of slowly morphed into more of a New York City analog than anything else with skyscrapers and all that. That always felt weird to me when all of a sudden just the imagery of Raccoon City changed. I have always preferred where it started out, which was as a small Midwestern town, because that kind of environment is where a corrupt corporation like Umbrella would be more likely to be able to get away with its bullshit, especially during the 90s and before the huge eruption of the internet and connectivity and all that and whistleblowing and all that kind of stuff. I don't see it being as realistic that they could get away with that in a massive metropolis kind of setting. But that's just me. I'm sure other people disagree. It doesn't bother me a whole lot either way. I'm just personally glad to see it being more of a small town again. With the interiors of the both the police station and the mansion, the key interiors, so the, the main lobby of the police station, the main lobby of the mansion, the library, we were literally one-to-one. -one. Uh, if we could, you know, as much as I, I, I possibly could, we literally recreated these locations um, exactly. It was, it was actually really nerdily fun to walk onto those locations that you've been playing, the game you've been playing, and, and then walking onto the locations. It, it's, I can't really explain it. I've never had that experience before, but it was very fun. Yeah, I already kind of gave my feelings on that, but just to... Uh... Just to think about the possibility of walking around a recreation of the Spencer Mansion and the RPD. As a fan, that would be mind-blowing. And even though I've always said to myself and to my friends that I would love to be a screenwriter if not for the fact that I could not survive in the general scumminess of Hollywood, I do really, really wish I could have somehow worked in or around the production of this movie because, oh man, it just would have been fascinating. The helicopter sequence here is, is a little bit of uh, the second game with the police, with the helicopter smashing into the police station. I transferred it to the first game, mixing it with uh, our um, storyline of Vickers, the cowardly uh, helicopter pilot. I, I sort of grabbed a bit of two and a bit of one, put it together here. 
Yeah, I pretty much assumed that when it came to my original trailer breakdown. I get it. You are combining the first two games, so it makes sense to to take two kind of helicopter-related moments and combine them into one and all that. It is a shame that we won't get to see much of Brad Vickers. He had a really memorable moment with Nemesis in the original Resident Evil 3, and then he had a more heroic end in the Resident Evil 3 remake. I liked them both. It's kind of a shame that we're not gonna see either of those, because there's no way he's surviving that zombie attack and the helicopter crash. But I get it. Brad wasn't a huge mainstay character, and he's one of the easiest to knock out early on. I really wanted to use Itchy Tasty. Uh, in this movie because I, I just always found that little uh, document. I, I found the phrase just really disturbing so I wanted to use it in the movie. I love that he decided to bring that up even though he could have just skipped right over it. But yeah, that's one of my... Actually, that's my favorite ending to any of the files in a Resident Evil game. It's That line has always stuck with me. It's, it's really cool to see it being referenced. The movie didn't have to reference it, and I don't think anybody would, would have complained if they didn't reference it, but it's neat that it made it in. I wouldn't want to give too much away while talking about the, uh, the creatures in this movie, but we, we had a lot of fun with all the different monsters. I tried to get in as many as I possibly could. I was, I was like a big kid on this movie. Um, so, and again, we worked very closely with Capcom. We got, you know, all their designs and references and, um, we would, we would use them. Or we'd always use that as a starting point, sometimes, sometimes changing or, you know, beefing up. Yeah, it's cool to hear that they had fun designing the monsters. The CGI is still something I'm hung up on because it just looks blurry and cartoony and not very detailed, to my eyes at least. But hey, I'm not going to complain about seeing the monster forms of Birkin in the movie or seeing the Lickers or the Cerberus. Do I think they could look better? Yeah. But bad CGI, and I haven't been clear enough about this in my previous videos, bad CGI is not going to make me hate this movie. It's not going to detract from the movie. It'll distract me while I'm watching it the first time. From that point forward, you know, it's going to be something I accept. We obviously had to use the uh, the liquor, any Resident Evil movie that's trying to go back to the, the roots of it all. So it was great fun to, to, to bring the liquor into the movie again. Um, and we did a lot of designs. We did, you know, we actually went tried all kinds of crazy designs you know try to like completely re-imagine it and and you know once we sort of got past that then we we actually went very classic really faithful again work with capcom to get the get the their original designs of the, the liquor and 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 just created our own version from that um and it's really cool it's a the liquor sequence in this movie is just amazing Okay, first of all, pay attention there. He said the liquor sequence looks amazing. So we were, we more than likely are just getting the one. So don't get your hopes up there. I wish we could see a bunch of them, but we might just be getting the one. With that said, the one that we see looks pretty amazing to me. It's a little annoying to hear that they tried to reinvent the wheel a little bit and they tried to redesign it and all that. It's like, dude, that's one of the most memorable monsters in gaming. Just leave it alone and it's great that they ended up doing that to me it looks straight out of the re2 remake which wasn't a major change from the original re2 but yeah it's like that just sounds like a lot of wasted effort trying to redesign the thing just do the thing <laughs> you know what i mean thank you for watching the resident evil welcome to raccoon city trailer with me uh, and listening to me break it down the movie is out on november 24th exclusively in theaters yeah, and I guess that's it. In my personal opinion, I heard a lot of things that up my excitement. There were a couple of negatives here and there, nothing that really detracts from my excitement or my hype. I'm still really looking forward to this movie. I was a bit down on it when I saw the first trailer that released, you know, the, the North American trailer, because the tone was just all over the place, and I saw the version with the stupid text popping up every time somebody spoke, and it was just, it was a horrible first impression. But then I saw the international trailer, and things kind of 
sorted itself out. So yeah, I am looking forward to this movie. It's a bummer that there's, that there's no Barry, seemingly, there's no Rebecca. Some of the changes are like, mm, I wouldn't have done that, but whatever. But I'm still really looking forward to this. And at the end of the day, it's more than likely going to be better than the Paul W.S. Anderson movies. I mean, come on. And he's still doing his same crap with Monster Hunter now. Johannes Roberts seems to have more of the right mindset. I believe just, you know, in general, like I said, it's a bit weird that they tried to reinvent the liquor, but the fact of the matter is they settled on the version that we know and love. That's what matters. With that said, Paul W.S. Anderson also said a lot about how he was such a big fan of the first three games and forced the cast to play them and all that. So that's in the back of my mind as well. Don't believe for a second that it isn't. But in general, I feel like this guy, Johannes Roberts, I think he is doing the best that he can. So thank you guys for watching. I found this interesting. I hope you guys did too. Like and subscribe. Share if you like. I have a Kofi, Ko Kofi. I have a donation page set up if, if you feel like donating. I'm never going to pressure any of you guys into it. I am trying to think up incentives for it just to like kind of give back to the people who do decide to donate but it's you know it's never gonna be a requirement for my viewers i love you guys and i thank you just for watching my videos and and all that even if you don't necessarily agree with what i'm saying just the fact that you're watching it and discussing it it's cool and it helps keep me excited to make more videos so again thank you guys keep an eye out for the resident evil apocalypse reaction that's when the giveaway is going to happen. I'm sorry other stuff keeps getting in the way, but technically the giveaway item is ready. Now I just got to edit a video and get it out. So with that said, I'm baffled. I hope to see you next time. Welcome to Raccoon City is a very faithful adaptation of the Resident Evil games. This is where it all started. Why are you back here, Claire? This is an origin story where we meet all the iconic characters from the games. We should split up. Every frame has details to the game, from the burger that the truck has eaten to the actual truck design. We built the mansion and police station to the spec of the game. Shall we go? This is a horror movie created with love of the game.